The gear has changed, the tactics have evolved, but some advice remains eternal. This video is a bit different from my usual as I'm gonna be reading you the words of Wyatt Earp, notorious Western gunfighter, lawman, and outlaw, depending upon when you caught up with him during his life between 1848 and 1929. I hope that you enjoy listening to this as much as I enjoyed reading it, both the first time as well as what will probably now be about the 20th time that I've read it. At the very end, I will also give you an amazing bonus quote of his to think about and reflect on when it comes to using firearms in self-defense. Let's get into it. So these are the words of Wyatt Earp when asked to give a talk about what it was like to be a gunfighter and survivor of perhaps dozens of shootouts, most famously the shootout at the OK Corral immortalized in media and movies. I have left out some of his introduction for sake of brevity where he expressed his partial reluctance to speak to these subjects. Here is Wyatt Earp. The most important lesson I have learned from those proficient gunfighters was the winner of a gunplay usually was the man who took his time. The second was that if I hoped to live long enough on the frontier, I would shun flashy trick shooting, grandstand play, as I would poison. I was a fair hand with a pistol, rifle, or shotgun, but I learned more about gunfighting from Tom Spears' cronies during the summer of 71 than I had dreamed was in the book. Those old timers took their gunplay seriously, which was natural under the conditions in which they lived. Shooting to them was considerably more than aiming at a mark and pulling a trigger. Models of weapons, methods of wearing them, means of getting them into action and operating them all to the one end of combining high speed with absolute accuracy contributed to the frontiersman's shooting skill. The sought after degree of proficiency was that which could turn the most effective account, the split second between life and death. Hours upon hours of practice and wide experience in actualities supported their arguments over style. When I say that I learned to take my time in a gunfight, I do not wish to be misunderstood, for the time to be taken was only that split fraction of a second that means the difference between deadly accuracy with a six gun and a miss. It is hard to make this clear to a man who has never been in a gunfight. Perhaps I can best describe the time taking as going into action with the greatest speed of which a man's muscles are capable, but mentally unflustered by an urge to hurry or the need for complicated nervous and muscular actions which trick shooting involves. Mentally deliberate, but muscularly faster than thought is what I mean. In all my life as a frontier police officer, I did not know a really proficient gunfighter who had anything but contempt for the gun fanner or the man who literally shot from the hip. In later years, I read a great deal about this type of gunplay, supposedly employed by men noted for skill with a 45. From personal experience and numerous six-gun battles which I witnessed, I can only support the opinion advanced by the men who gave me my most valuable instruction in fast and accurate shooting, which was that the gun fanner and hip shooter stood small chance to live against a man who, as old Jack Gallagher always put it, took his time and pulled the trigger once. Cocking and firing mechanisms on new revolvers were almost invariably altered by their purchasers in the interest of a smoother, effortless handling, usually by filing the dog which controlled the hammer, some going so far as to remove the triggers entirely or lash them against the guard, in which cases the guns were fired by thumbing the hammer. This is not to be confused with fanning, in which the triggerless gun is held in one hand while the other was brushed rapidly across the hammer to cock the gun and firing it by the weight of the hammer itself. A skillful gun fanner could fire five shots from a 45 so rapidly that the individual reports were indistinguishable, but what could happen to him in a gunfight was pretty close to murder. I saw Jack Gallagher's theory borne out so many times in deadly operation that I was never tempted to forsake the principles of gunfighting as I had them from him and his associates. There was no man in the Kansas City group who was Wild Bill's equal with a six gun. Bill's correct name, by the way, was James B. Hickok. Legend and the imaginations of certain people have exaggerated the number of men he killed in gunfights and have misrepresented the manner in which he did his killing. At that, they could not very well overdo his skill with pistols. Hickok knew 
all the fancy tricks and was as good as the best at that sort of gunplay. But when he had serious business at hand, a man to get, the acid test of marksmanship, I doubt if he employed them. At least he told me that he did not. I have seen him in action and I never saw him fan a gun, shoot from the hip, or try to fire two pistols simultaneously. Neither have I ever heard a reliable old timer tell of any trick shooting employed by Hickok when fast, straight shooting meant life or death. That two gun business is another matter that can stand some truth before the last of the old timer gunfighters have gone on. They wore two guns, most of the six gun toters did, and when the time came for action, went after them with both hands. But they didn't shoot them that way. Primarily, two guns made the threat of something in reserve. They were useful as a display of force when a lone man stacked up against the crowd. Some men could shoot equally well with either hand, and in a gunplay, might alternate their fire. Others exhausted the loads from the gun on the right or the left, as the case might be, then shifted the reserve weapon to the natural shooting hand if that was necessary and possible. Such a move, the border shift, could be made faster than the eye could follow a top-notch gun thrower. But if the man was as good as that, the shift would seldom be required. Whenever you see a picture of some two-gun man in action with both weapons held closely against his hips and both spit and smoke together, you could put it down that you're looking at a picture of a fool or a fake. I remember quite a few of those so-called two-gun men who tried to operate everything at once, but like the fanners, they didn't last long in proficient company. In the days of which I'm talking, among men who I have in mind, when a man went after his guns, he did so with a single, serious purpose. There was no such thing as a bluff. When a gunfighter reached for his 45, every faculty he owned was keyed to shooting as speedily and as accurately as possible to making his first shot the last of the fight. He just had to think of his gun solely as something with which to kill another before he himself could be killed. The possibility of intimidating an antagonist was remote, although the drop was thoroughly respected and few men in the West could draw against it. I have seen men so fast and so sure of themselves that they did go after their guns while men who intended to kill them had them covered and what is more would win out in the play. They were rare. It is safe to say for all general purposes that anything in gunfighting that smacked of show off or bluff was left to braggarts who were ignorant or careless with their lives. I might add that I never knew a man who amounted to anything to notch his gun with credits, as they were called, for men he had killed. Outlaws, gunmen of the wild crew who killed for the sake of brag, followed this custom. I have worked with most of the noted peace officers, Hickok, Billy Tillman, Pat Sugra, Bat Masterson, Charlie Bassett, and others of like caliber have handled their weapons many times but never knew one of them to carry a notched gun. There are two other points about the old time method of using six guns most effectively that do not seem to be generally known. One is that the gun was not cocked with the ball of the thumb. As his gun was jerked into action, the old timer closed the whole joint of his thumb over the hammer and the gun was cocked in that fashion. The soft flesh of the thumb ball might slip if a man's hands were moist and slip was not to be chanced if humanly avoidable. This thumb joint method was employed whether or not a man used the trigger for firing. On the second point, I've often been asked why five shots without reloading were all a top-notch gunfighter fired when his guns were chambered for six cartridges. The answer is merely safety. To ensure against accidental discharge of the gun while in the holster, Due to hair trigger adjustments, the hammer rested upon an empty chamber. As widely as this was known and practiced, the number of cartridges a man carried in his six gun may be taken as an indication of a man's rank with the gunfighters of the old school. Practice gun wielders had too much respect for their weapons to take unnecessary chances with them. It was only with tyros and would-bees that you heard of accidental discharges or didn't know it was loaded injuries in the country where carrying a colt was a man's prerogative. 
So I hope that you found that as interesting as I do. I enjoy reading a lot of the old time Western books, a lot of the old books from the 19th, 20th century as well, which feels a little weird to say old time books in 20th century in the same sentence, but there you go. So guys, before I get to the one immortal quote that I wanna close on, if you could just take a moment, let me know if you liked this style of video in the comments below. How did I do? Do you want to see more things like this? What other things should I be looking into? And also, of course, let this video get out there. Help us build the channel both in the algorithm as well as letting us know that you liked it by clicking like, sharing the video around, and of course, subscribe to make sure you don't miss any of our future content. Also, as a note, if you feel like supporting the channel, we tremendously appreciate that. You may notice a join button for memberships and a story. So guys, here's the quote. Fast is fine, but accuracy is final. You must learn to be slow in a hurry. We appreciate you sticking around this long. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content and we'll see you in the next one.